I'm M. Sauter, better known as Pints and Panels. And I'm Don Tess, better known as the Don of Beer. Welcome to the 33rd episode of the All About Beer podcast. Every two weeks, we talk with leading experts and take a deep dive into one topic in beer. This, this week on the show, we'll be talking about cellaring beer. I'm really looking forward to this. But first, please visit allaboutbeer.com and follow us on social media at All About Beer. And if you're feeling generous, visit our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash allaboutbeer to support this show and others. Don, I'm assuming you sell our beer. Uh, I do. I've been doing it for a long time. And sometimes <laughs> I even do it on purpose. Um, <laughs> how about you, Em? Um, I like I like uh, higher alcohol stuff with a bit of age on it. Barley yeah. wines, uh, imperial stouts. I like a good year on them. I've got some really good Imperial Stout verticals in my basement. Um, plus, I like to save beers to see how they age, like Bigfoot Barley Wine from Sierra Nevada. I love holding on to a six-pack a year for that. Mm. Um, I, I like when beer gets aged. Sometimes, though, I forget to drink it, though. And then you That's... go down into your cellar, <laughs> and you're like, oh, 2016. Hmm, oops. Um, and you're not doing these beers any favors, so... I, I like it. I just got to remember to drink them. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I have the same problem. Yeah. So if you would like to support the All About Beer podcast, reach out to podcast at allaboutbeer.com. Speaking of supporting the show, here's a word from our sponsors. Malt Europe Malting Company is based in North America, specializing in growing and producing quality malts for the craft beer and distilling industries. With local farms and malt houses spread across the United States, Canada, and Mexico, Malt Europe Malting Company's commitment to excellence is fully ingrained into every batch it produces, ensuring breweries and distilleries of any size can create the finest beverages on the planet. Visit MaltEuropeMaltingCo.com to learn how Malt Europe Malting Company can support your malting needs. Contact Malt Europe Malting Company at customer success at MaltEurope.com or dial 844-546-MALT for questions or to place your order. Patrick Dawson is the author of Vintage Beer and the Beer Geek Handbook. When not at home in Denver, he's traveling the globe in search of new and exciting beers. Welcome to the show, Patrick. Hi, thanks for having me on. Yeah, thank you for being here. Um, so when I run the podcast, because Don and I switch every other episode, uh, one of the questions I usually ask is quite broad to start off. And uh, my question to you is, so you've written vintage beers, you you know about cellaring beer and vintage beers. Why cellar beer? What is the point to a lot of people... You know, when you learn about beer, drink beer fresh, IPA, stuff like that. Um, but why would you purposefully age and sell our beer? Absolutely. I mean, it's it's such a good question. And to be honest, I feel like it's a question that not everybody maybe asks themselves before they do start selling beer. <laughs> and it was that question that inspired me to write this book. Um, because, you know, I, I would find it. First of all, I, the book got published, I think it was like 2012, but I got the idea for the book and I think about 2009. So, right. So the beer world has changed radically since that time. Um, and at that time, like, you know, beer was really starting to, to blow up and, and people were getting really excited. I mean, there was sort of like that, like collecting mania, you know, where like, you know, it happens in everything, like, you know, comic books that beanie babies or like whatever but um and a lot of people were were taking these like rare beers and they were assuming that they would age well and they were just like collecting them and celebrating like crazy and and i would go to these tastings and, and i fell victim to some of that myself and and you would taste this beer that like was once great and definitely no longer was so that's that's what got me really interested in understanding the science behind it First, for my own purposes, and then be like, man, I got to get this information out so people know about it. Um, so that's maybe like the preamble, the precursor to your, to your question of like why you would age a beer. And and I think the answer to that question is it, it depends somewhat on the style, but um, it's typically to allow like new and and hopefully like exciting, different, complex flavors to develop. 
that that weren't there and perhaps allow maybe some like negative flavors or negative aspects of the beer to like reduce or maybe even disappear um would i guess that that would be my my general answer i just saw this is a side note i just saw someone who had collected sierra nevada sierra nevada celebration and they had him going back to 15 years uh -huh. and th my first thought was no <laughs> No, <laughs> I have a whole collection of stale, fresh hop beers. And it's just, yeah. so, but then I was like, well, no, maybe that there's something I'm missing. Um, um but maybe I'm yeah. not, you know, I, I would say in that case for that beer, no, probably not. <laughs> You're probably not missing much. So I what, think yeah, what's happening to that beer as it's, you know, if I'm sitting on a 10 year old fresh hop beer, what's happening to that beer when it's so, in there? So hops, like there's so many aspects of a beer that they can like change in positive ways for the, the right beer over time. Hops are pretty much just decidedly negative. Like nothing good happens to hops over time. So, so hops that are like really high in alpha acids. So, you know, that beer in particular is going to be very high in alpha acids. Um, they, they, they oxidize um, and they create like this really bad compound called trans 2 non and all, which is like, like people describe it as cardboard or wet paper. I just kind of struggle with that description because I don't know, maybe I don't need enough cardboard, <laughs> but like, <laughs> Um, that's just not a flavor I identify, but it's just like, it's just stale, right? Like when you mm -hmm. eat something just that's like old, like you're eating crackers, you're like, how long has this box been open? Like, mm -hmm. I don't know, like people struggle to describe that flavor, it's, but it's yeah. just old, right? Like in beer, typically that old flavor is going to be trans on and all. And that, um, co it can come from a, a number of things, but most primarily, I, um, alpha acids, uh, I summarized alpha acids and hops. So it creates like a bad flavor, right? So number one, not a good reason to, to do it. And then number two, like those, the hop flavors are just so sensitive and, and they, they're just so fleeting and they disappear really quickly. And that's what makes that beer so special, right? I mean, yeah. those like just amazing, delicious, awesome, uh, volatile hop flavors, but you know, they're, they're gone for all intents and purposes after a year, you know? Um, so sometimes there's some beers that like, Hey, look at this, like all these hoppy flavors disappeared and it's still good, but it's sort of in my experience, like a happy surprise, you know, it's not anything I would ever like strive to, to sell or figure out and what's going to happen. And it's kind of not that beer anymore. Like it's not even really fair to call it the same beer. Right? Absolutely. Yeah, totally. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Keep going. No, no, you didn't interrupt me at all. It, it, and it's funny because like, I, you know, I, I, I interviewed or I've interviewed like so many brewers over time. And, and I think that this has kind of changed, but when I was first getting into this, like they would get so annoyed by people that aged their beers because they're like, no, that's not my beer. <laughs> like, I like released my beer at the perfect time when it's, when it's supposed to be like, you know, at its peak. And then, you know, here's this guy that sits on it for five years that says, says they don't like it. So, yeah. <laughs> common sentiment out there. Are there any beer styles that brewers think you should? Because I, I have opinions about, like, I really like when beer to guards have a little age on it. I know other people disagree with me. I like that mushroom basement quality that yeah. Belgian beers can get when you age them. Um, is there, um, or Lambics or higher alcohol stuff, is there things people should be looking for? For that they could potentially age should they want to lay something down for later in life or you know for the winter or summer yeah absolutely and i mean i think from just a really simple standpoint like you're looking for a beer that has something that is going to slow the aging of that beer and and typically and when we say aging for the for the most part like what we're talking about is like slowing oxidation of the beer um and and the the two most typical things that are going to do that that you can find in a beer is going to be high alcohol so like i mean at a minimum eight percent but like i mean basically just the higher the better um and uh the other one is going to be acidity uh so so that that acidity is typically going to come from a beer that um 
has, you know, is, is produced with Britannomyces or uh, something like that. And the, the acidity will, will slow the oxidation, but more importantly, the Britannomyces and some of that other like microbiota that's in a beer, it's going to scavenge a lot of those, those, that radical oxygen that's in, in the beer. It's really just going to like overall like, slow it. Um, so those, those are the, the big things, but I mean, it's really interesting. Like, I, I feel like if, if we had this conversation when my book first came out in 2012, like it's very different than now. Um, back then, brewers, they weren't, I, I mean, except for just this incredibly small contingent, they weren't brewing beers to age. Um, you know, they, they, it just, it was just such a unknown concept. And, and I think from a commercial standpoint, from like a, like a financial standpoint, it wasn't like a proven niche for, for breweries to pursue. And that's just changed so much since then. Like now beer consumers are just so much savvier and, and they know what they like and they, they've proven with their, with their wallets that, that they they love aged beers and, and particularly like like barrel aged beers and and a lot of these um like really like uh Belgian inspired uh lambic beers and or, or sour beers and um and and breweries are doing so much of that on their own now right so uh, uh back in 2012 you you needed to be really uh researched uh, to know what beers to age and what made what made a beer um, a good aging candidate, but now nowadays brewers are doing that for you, and you can go into your average bottle shop and pick up vintage beers for all intents and purposes just on the shelf, and you don't have to buy them. I mean, my my cellar has gotten considerably smaller now than than it was back then, and it's just because hey, I don't need to do this myself, wow. <laughs> and and. And brewers are like, are brewing these, they, these incredible beers. I mean, beers that are designed to not only like withstand age, but to like, like improve with it. So instead of it just being this happy accident that, Hey, this brewer didn't intend for this beer to improve, but it did. Um, they're doing it intentionally now and doing it so well. Like, um, one of your, your recent podcasts with, um, Lindsay Langton from, bottle logic i mean they they are like just such an amazing example of this they just they produce beers that are just they have just such fantastic age characteristics to them and the way that she was talking about designing their beers yeah, um, around the like, barrel yeah <laughs> exactly like to to improve like to to be ready after all that oxidation after that age um, was just, it, it's just so refreshing to, to talk to brewers now, uh, that, that it's kind of like come full circle. It's just, I feel like it's a really exciting times, uh, to, for those of us that, that do appreciate those, those age characteristics of beer. Um, so you talked about how, you know, the, the beer flavors will change slowly over time. Uh, is there a limit to that? Like, um, you know, after one year, this much will change. And after two years, this much. And, but like after 10 years, it's going to change as much as it's going to change. So the difference between a 10 year old and a 15 year old is, is the same. Or, I would or say, does, go ahead. Yeah. Like every beer, every beer is going to be a little different. Right. So like, so like if you've got a commercial beer that a brewery makes like every year, it's just like over and over and over again, like big, like Sierra Nevada big foot's like a great example. Um, then, yeah, like, I think, like, people have a pretty good idea of, like, hey, this is how this beer is going to trend over time and where it's going to be at, at five years or 10 years or 15 years. Um, but I think, like, like from a general standpoint, like, even if you break it down to, like, a style, like English barley wines or whatever, it it just varies so much depending on the ingredients used, the brewing techniques used. And, um, and then, and then just like the amount of residual oxygen in the beer that I, it's, it's just so hard to, to generalize it too much. Um, okay. that, that some beers, they, you know, they, they might be like the same style, 
and and taste somewhat similar fresh, but one might hit its peak at year five and another one might be at year one, you know? So I have a, a bottle of Cantillon that's over 20 years old. And I, every time I say I'm going to open it, I can't bring myself to open it because it's <laughs> 20 years old. So yeah. you're, you're not, <laughs> I was hoping you would convince me that it's really done doing what it's going to do. And you I should, should just, just drink, drink it. it. Just drink it, Don. <laughs> I would, okay, okay. Yeah. So let's get down to like that specific one. Yeah. The difference that that beer is going to undergo uh, in like, between now and, and five years from now, he's going to be pretty minimal. And I would say that you do always run the danger, particularly with these like older lambics and the, the corks that, you know, that cork might just dry up a little bit or something. Yeah. You know, in 20 years, if something's going to happen, it's probably already happened. But you never know that like, yeah, I get nervous about sitting on those too long. Like I've got some really old views too that I'm always like... It, I, I I could totally empathize. I'm in the same boat of like, oh, is it worth sitting on this any, any longer? Is that cork dried out? Should I just open it? But you have like <laughs> sentimental attachment to some of those. That's bottles. exactly my problem right now. Is it <laughs> sentimental? So. Yeah. Dr drink the damn beer. <laughs> yes, I know you're right. Rationally, am I know you're right. I just can't bring myself to do it. I yeah, I have. Well, because you're looking for the thing about vintage beer is you're looking for a good time. And I think the point of this podcast is any time is a good time to drink yes. a cellar. You know, oh you don't God. need to wait for it's Halloween today. Well, we're we're talking today. Yeah. Um, this yeah. episode comes out in a few weeks. Um, you know, it's Thursday. I don't. It's uh, I don't know. Like big, you know, bagel with cream cheese day. I don't know. Em, I don't have time for your truths. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah, um, we're off topic. Yeah, I wanted anyway. Drink your damn beer, everybody. Okay. Um. I wanted to ask, we did talk, I wanted to come back to something. We talked about what hops do as they age, but what happens to other ingredients, malt, um, yeast, bacteria, what else happens as the aging process happens? What happens to those beer ingredients? Yeah. So like, like malt, the, the big things that's going to happen is um, there that it's generally going to turn sweeter in flavor, mm -hmm. uh, but it will like reduce in viscosity, right? So, um, you know, if you're if you're drinking a beer or if you're a brewer and you're designing a beer, um, you know, it you you need to to compensate or understand that like, okay, that this the, the sweet flavors are going to come out more, but that like the residual sugars that help those sweet flavors shine are going to reduce. And if you have a beer where it's like it's got these really sweet flavors, but it's then it's just a very kind of unpleasant experience. It's like, this ever seen like Coke or Diet Coke, right? To me, um, something like that. So um, that that's that's gonna be the the general situation on malts, um, on on alcohols. The particularly like if you're talking about um, higher alcohols, right? So the the alcohol that we all know in beers, ethyl alcohol, that's just like the standard alcohol, but. Um, you know, every beer has like lots of other like higher alcohols, they call them. And and when you taste a beer and you're like, ooh, this is really boozy or hot, it's simply those higher alcohols that, that you're tasting. Those are going to turn um, more like, uh, they, they can turn fruity over time, but they can also turn um, somewhat like hazelnut or amaretto as mm. well as, as time goes on. And then one of the other cool things that, that they can do is sometimes they can combine with uh, different acids that are present in a beer. And some of them take quite a while to, to present, to, but uh, to create esters, right? So esters in a beer are, are the fruity flavors that you're typically gonna taste from, from ales or, or, or from yeast. So like, you know, classic ones is like a Hefeweizen, that banana flavor um, is that's that's an example of an ester or, you know, some of the pears or apples, those tree fruit type flavors that you get out of like just a lot of typical ales. Um, those are esters, but there's there's some unique and fun esters that can come out over time with those those higher alcohols as they combine with these acids. And they're they're sort of more like wine or port like uh, flavored that, oh. that come through. Um, and, and it also creates some of those more like. Uh, think of them as like like raisins, figs, uh, you know, prunes, that 
that type of flavors that you know you taste in cherries and ports, but you also taste in like vintage barley wines and 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 aged beers. Um, so yeah, those those are the I think the the the, the big ones to consider is going to be the alcohol flavors and the uh, the malt flavors, and then of course like I guess in the in sour beers and lambic flavors uh, or in lambic beer lambic style beers. Uh, those those are just like a, a totally different ball game because the ingredients are just so different. Um, you know, there's so many different acids that are being created and and different phenols that are being created over time uh, from from Britannomyces and then you know some of these like uh, ancillary bacteria uh, that that they can create. You know, a lot of these like you you mentioned that that mushroomy that cellular flavor. Um, you know those. Those are just a, a byproduct of, of different acids uh, being produced, along with this this secondary fermentation. Uh, they can come along, but I feel like a lot of those flavors they come across like almost more like wine like as they age. Like if you've had a really vintage goose, um, it, it it's it's challenging to even think of them in terms of beer flavors. You know, it's like it's almost easier to use like champagne descriptors and stuff to describe a lot of those like really mature goose beers. Hmm, that sounds good. <laughs> um, are there any particular beers slash vintages that you've been impressed by that, you know, our listeners should maybe keep their eyes open for? For sure. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's it, like I said, my cellar is pretty small. I mean, I've just gotten like, so much pickier over time that like i just go with so many of just like the old standbys um i mean any of the like classic lambic producers i mean they're just they're all going to do excellence um you, you really can't go go wrong with with any of with any of them um particularly i mean i mean they all like you know the, the big ones all do so well but um those, those are really good and then i i found that the american producers are making like lambic inspired beers um they're they're they've just come so far in these last 10 years um and some of those early vintages early versions produced by the american producers did not um have not aged well but the ones in the last like five years i've had like i mean like chester king spawn i mean that's just absolutely beautiful as it ages um you know i i live in colorado primitive beer out here i mean they just do just such beautiful blends that i just feel like can can really be put up against side by side to those those classic Belgian producers. Um, so so yeah, that's that's the one that I'm I'm always stocking those away. Um, but but other beers that that I love um, is like Sammy Claus uh, is is just a, a great classic beer that does really well. Yep. Anything from the Dole, um, you know, it's like still knocked um, is is just absolutely fantastic. Um, and then on the on the um the imperial stout front my favorite is is probably the most consistent is going to be bottle logic i i hmm. i tend to have a lot of them in my cellar they just do really well and and their beers are just i think they're just so well made so professionally made that a lot of those you know they use a lot of like additional ingredients right and um and and oftentimes those flavors are, are pretty fleeting, but if you have a really conscientious brewer that pays a lot of attention to their their oxygen ingress and stuff like that, they're going to last a lot longer. And I just feel like those are ones that that have really proven that they can stand up against some time. Right. I think same thing with the brewery. Anything from the brewery is excellent. Mm. There's just a few, I guess, off the top of my head. Bigfoot. Hearing about a Bigfoot, that's like that's like that's like classic for me. I, I buy a six pack every year. So I have a ton. Of I, I'll, yep. Do that every year. I, I actually, I think it's really rough, fresh. I like that I, beer with like a year, at least a year. I have one every six months. Yes. I mean, I love it. I agree. It's, it's a little rough, fresh for me. I know some people love it fresh. Um, but like, to me, like, I feel like my favorite years are like year one and year 10. And I love them for just mm. entirely different reasons but they're just like so good but for so, so such different uh they they check so many different boxes but yeah year one is just it's still so hoppy it's inc 
incredible. Like how really hot hoppy, is. even after a year. Um, but yeah, that that heat has really mellowed and allows so much of that that the underlying beer to really shine. So my last question is: If I'm, uh, let's say, I've got some beer in my basement or in a closet, or I want to sell her some beer, what are some best practices that people at home can do? to make sure they're selling beer and uh, keeping vintage beer the correct way. I like, no, like, thank you so much for asking because yeah, like number one, number one is temperature. Um, just don't age it warm or, or even room temperature. Um, or if you do like, don't do it more than a year or so. And, and temper your expectations that don't judge a beer. If you do age it for a really long time at, at a at room temperature or something like that. I mean, I, I've been lucky enough to get, to try a you know a lot of a lot of aged beers over time from a lot of different sellers, and what I have found is the single biggest variable that the home seller can have is temperature. Um, you know, so I ideally is fifty five. Uh, it, it's I've had beers that you know I, I've felt like oh that beer doesn't age that well blah blah blah, and then I have uh, that that same beer from. Uh, you know, somebody that's got like a temperature control of 55 degree cellar. And I'm just like, wow, this is so different. And I can't believe um, how well it's held up. So that'd be the number one thing. And then, you know, kind of the obvious, like keep it out of, um, you know, sunlight and uh, try and shoot for like consistent temperature. Um, you know, see if you can put it in like styrofoam shipper boxes or something like that. If it's a space that experiences some temperature swings. Um, awesome. I I have some friends who will actually melt wax and 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 wax dip non wax dipped bottles on the thought that it will reduce oxygen ingress. Do you agree or disagree, or that's more trouble than you think it's worth, or what a great idea? <laughs> I think probably the latter. Okay. Um, I mean, just the more trouble that I think it's worth. Like, is it going to hurt anything? Like, no, certainly is it going to hurt anything. Um, but you know, they, they've proven that, the caps, uh, particularly like, you know, I mean, caps that have been used for the last like 10 or 15 years with their like oxygen scavenging caps, like they, they do a good job of sealing the beer. Um, and, um, it, it's just not, not really necessary. I think, um, there's maybe something to like, if it's a corked beer and you want to keep that cork from, from drying out, um, you know, perhaps that, that might help a little bit. Uh, but. You know, talking to brewers, you know, I've asked so many brewers that, that dip their beer in wax and it's always just like, no, it just helps it sell better. And I just like the way it works. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, Patrick, thank you so much for your time today. This was really fascinating. And we're really happy that you, we got to talk about cellaring beer, best practices, what happens. Uh, if people want to reach out to you with questions, do you have social media or a website or any email that you'd like to pass out? <laughs> um, not really. I'm I'm sort of a, a social media recluse. Okay. Um, I'm not, I, 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 I wrote this book purely out of passion. It's not like my profession or anything like that. So I sort of like wrote it and I put it out there and I just kind of like crawled back into my life. Um, I do, <laughs> I do have a Facebook account that um, I check like every six months. Okay. <laughs> so, so feel yeah. free to send me a message on, on Facebook. <laughs> it just might take me a while to get back to you. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for your honesty. Uh, <laughs> so people don't, if they reach out to you, know what, what to expect, or you could, we could always, they could reach out to us with questions and we can pass them on to you. We can be your conduit. Um, for sure. Yeah, that'd yeah. be awesome. Yeah, of course. That works. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. This was really awesome. We uh, really appreciate it. And uh, now I want to go drink some old sours that are in my basement next to where the cat goes to the bathroom. So I really should move <laughs> those. Thanks, <Absolutely>. Patrick. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity. I, I really appreciate it, guys. All About Beer is back. And we're asking for your support to help provide the independent beer media this rich and colorful industry deserves. Visit our website, allaboutbeer.com, where we're frequently posting new content. And please consider throwing us a few bucks at patreon.com slash allaboutbeer. We have low-cost memberships for individuals and small and large companies alike. Every dollar goes to help produce new articles and podcasts. 
Malt Europe Malting Company is based in North America, specializing in growing and producing quality malts for the craft beer and distilling industries. With local farms and malt houses spread across the United States, Canada, and Mexico, Malt Europe Malting Company's commitment to excellence is fully ingrained into every batch it produces, ensuring breweries and distilleries of any size can create the finest beverages on the planet. Visit MaltEuropeMaltingCo.com to learn how Malt Europe Malting Company can support your malting needs. Contact Malt Europe Malting Company at customer success at MaltEurope.com or dial 844-546-MALT for questions or to place your order. Mike Fognac, head brewer and co-owner at the Establishment Brewing Company, started off as a passionate home brewer over 15 years ago. On his journey down the rabbit hole of brewing, he has become a national certified beer judge, top home brewer in Canada in 2016, and has opened up the Establishment Brewing Company in 2019. In its five years of operation, the establishment has been awarded Al Brewery of the Year in 2021 and again in 2023, and was the Canadian Brewery of the Year in 2021. Welcome to the show, Mike. Thanks for having me. So, can you explain a bit about the seller program at your brewery? Don has told me a little about it, uh, but as I'm unfortunate, I've never been to your brewery yet. Um, uh, yet. Thank you, Don. Um, I haven't been to Canada in like, I mean, this is a side note, in a very long time. I really need to remedy that because I'm a big fan of what you guys do up there. Um, <laughs> anyway, can you explain the seller program of your brewery uh, and what you're doing, what you're laying down, why you're doing it, stuff like that? Okay, awesome. Yeah, that's a that's a fairly open ended question. So I think yes, I'll have is. to back up just a little bit and maybe start <laughs> sure. with uh, kind of what we do at the brewery. So uh, at the establishment brewing company, we do a variety of beers, you kind of have a, a slogan that's like, we don't discriminate against any beer styles. So we love to brew everything. And uh, some of that beer that we're making is uh, a unique style, uh, mixed culture, or wild beer, uh, aged in barrels, and also in stainless steel tanks. But um, that style of beer particularly does uh, does really well with some aging. So we do sell her some of that beer here at the establishment. Um, always whenever we release one of these beers in our 750 ml bottles or actually in, in some of our sleek cans now that we're doing uh, wild beer in sleek cans as well. Um, we'll sell her some of it uh, mainly kind of for posterity, but also it kind of gives us an opportunity to uh, to provide a little bit of like a a backlog or like a library of kind of all the releases we've ever done. So if you do come to the brewery, uh, we do have a, a seller menu uh, and then we have a, a selection of, of beers there available from like kind of the back catalog uh, that people can, can enjoy at the brewery. So that's kind of, that's kind of it at a, in a nutshell. So it's just sours or are you doing any other or laying down anything else? Well, there's all, so pretty much all kinds of wild beer. So not not all wild beers is, is going to be Thank sour. You for, yep, that is but true. Uh, and and we can talk a little bit more about that. We're always trying to create a, a balanced profile. Um, and we've learned a lot over the past you know five years that we've been open. Um, our beers initially are wild beers since since they all use our house culture. Um, they they really uh, have changed. Uh, the house culture has evolved, and we also have kind of adapted to uh to that change with the way that we treat these beers and the way that we uh create our recipes to try to subdue some of the acidity so over time um as as we evolve the acidity of our program is actually getting a lot lower and lower uh by virtue of uh the recipe design and also by how we're blending these beers so our goal for, for this program is actually to make less and less sour beer i'm using quotations and and more uh what we like to call wild beer. And there is going to be some acidity in certain cases, but not always. Like our, our house culture has PDO, it has lactobacillus, but we're really trying to uh, address, um, you know, runaway acidity. Uh, and yeah, so it's kind of fun to to be able to come to the brewery and, and try some of our, uh, you know, the beers that we were making three years ago and, and compare them to beers that we have currently available um, and, and see how, how that, how our program has evolved and it's kind of really exciting to be able to share that with people. How do you, um, you mentioned, you know, recipe design and, and reducing the acidity. So is that by recipe design, are you providing more or less fuel for the uh, food? Sorry. Food is probably a better word for the different microbes. 
Mm -hmm. or yeah absolutely i think i think there's kind of like two approaches that we've uh taken uh in the past few years and they would be the primary one would be more hops so uh, i think lactobacillus yeah. is quite uh quite susceptible well certain strains are quite susceptible to um to, to ibus or, or hop oils uh and and it kind of helps subdue the production of acidity or kind of at least yeah. lactic acidity yeah. yeah yeah absolutely but there's also pedio now pedio is kind of the the tricky one to control because pedio can make a lot of um a lot of acidity with very little sugars and it typically is hop tolerant so but it's slower growing luckily so we can uh we so the second thing we do not only do we add a lot of hops or more hops these days we're doing uh we're doing like a lower mash temperature so we're hoping that our house culture uh you know our house culture has saccharomyces has Britannomyces. we're we're basically trying to create a highly fermentable wort so the sack and the bread is able to eat up those sugars before the pdo starts kicking in and really starting creating like ripping acidity so there's yeah more hops lower mash temp trying to create a fermentable wort those are those are kind of the two things that we're doing recently okay. um yeah and then on uh, top of that we're blending so we're we're th since we have over 80 barrels at a brewery to blend from we are making some non we are making some uh saison with just brett uh so it's highly attenuated there's like no sugars left and we're using that as some blending stock to blend down um some of the acidity that we have in our barrels currently because we have barrels that are you know one and a half years old two years old and and they're delicious but the acidity is too high on their own so we're using some other uh barrels as blending stock to, to help tamper some of that okay cool yeah so yeah you're like a blender yeah so you're taking like kind of old world things and creating you can create new beer styles with things you're aging and cellaring in, in barrels so yeah it's kind absolutely of a two, twofold thing going on yeah i'm, I'm into it and and you know honestly now that you mentioned that just a idea popped in my head we're, we're really excited about uh taking that even a step further and and we've got a beer right now uh that we're very excited about uh but just general generally taking the idea of using hops in a larger uh like using more hops in these beers we're taking that further and we're actually dry hopping or blending uh mixed culture beer with with ipas and we're loving the results of that so there's going to be a lot more like hop and mixed culture interaction coming out of our brewery in the future and we're just super excited about that so we have uh like we have a saison that we you know we we whirlpooled heavily with with some traditional and new age hops and we dry hopped it and it's uh it's so good and it's it's brewed with our house culture and so there's like a the acidities just it's just a little bit of tartness and the Britannomyces is able to do some really funky things with the hops and it's just like overripe fruit a little bit of acidity uh just a beautiful beer and and so you know this is an evolving program and ask me five years ago if we'd ever be doing something like that it'd be like oh maybe but it's uh yeah it's super fun so very cool very cool that is super cool so you're releasing stuff every year what have you noticed that changes over time so if things are getting drier or things getting more funky what's the what's happening in your beers over the years yeah so um i i have talked a lot about uh you know how our approach to making these beers has changed so um that's you know we're getting a little bit we're trying to push the program towards lower acidity and more uh you know using more hops and just changing the recipe a little bit but if you uh I, i'm guessing that your question is more like what happens in the bottle in the cellar mm -hmm. uh i think that's a really fun thing uh i think these beers are really good for cellaring because they are they have a lot of wild yeast and bacteria that are alive in the in the final product so we we can can or we uh bottle condition these so when when they go into a bottle um they receive a little bit of extra sugar and we and we sometimes add a little bit of extra yeast there to help carbonate the beer in the bottle uh, but all of that wild yeast and bacteria that uh has transformed these beers in the barrel stays in the bottle and and those microbes are really good at scavenging oxygen so as they stay alive so you kind of have to think about the bottle 
mixed culture beer in a bottle or wild beer in a bottle is like a living thing. It has a, a certain lifespan where there's going to be active microbes. And during that time where those microbes are still active, you know, there's some residual uh, nutrients and sugars that they're able to consume um, and some carbohydrates left over. Uh, and also, you know, as, as those microbes die off, the other microbes actually, you know, eat those enzymes that those microbes release and, and, uh, and, and there's kind of like a, a, a life cycle in the bottle. Uh, at one point though, the, all those microbes are going to die off. They're going to run out of food. And at that point, the beer actually starts, in my opinion, uh, degrading. And I think that time frame depends on how you sell the beer, how cold you're keeping it in your cellar. Um, lower temperatures will slow down those metabolic activities and you kind of have longer quote unquote shelf life with your cellar bottle. Uh, so it's kind of hard to say how each beer changes. So I would say that like they all go through that same life cycle. And I'd say that, you know, I've had some beers that are cellared for 10 years uh, and they've dropped off. Like they're not as good as they were, you know, year two or year four. Um, uh, so because those microbes have died, oxygen starts getting in through the cap uh, and you start getting uh, oxidative changes, which at first might not be bad, but over, you know, a 10 year cycle, uh, it, it gets worse. So um, luckily our beers haven't got to that point yet. Uh, we've only been open for five years. So all our beers it, have held up really nicely. But I think if you're selling any of these beers, just please keep in mind that at one point they're not going to get any better. They're actually going to start getting worse. So I would recommend uh, drinking them around two years you know, two years probably is when they peak. Uh, and then they're probably going to start falling off around year three or four. So uh, don't forget about the, <laughs> these beers in your cellar. Um, <laughs> if yeah. you want to, uh, and especially the fruited ones, like we do a lot of heavily fruited wild beers. And I would say drink those fresh. Like we, when we put these beers out to the market, uh, available to, to buy in our tap room and, uh, and elsewhere, uh, they're, they're ready to drink at that moment. Uh, they're going to change in the bottle. I think the fruited beers are going to get, like the fruit aromas and flavors are going to start dropping off pretty much immediately. So if you want something that's like jammy, heavily fruited, um, drink it as soon as possible. You can try to sell her one and see what happens. Uh, the fruit will change and drop off a little bit. So the balance might change. Um, you know, there might be a little bit more acidity that develops. Uh, some of the flavors might mellow out. Uh, but in general, um, if you want the biggest fruit expression, drink it as soon as possible. Um, then there's other beers. If they're really high alcohol, uh, you know, they might mellow out a little bit, but it's kind of hard to say how each of them, each of them evolve. And it's kind of interesting too, because it's almost impossible to time travel. Well, it's impossible to time travel, but it's hard. You have to use your memory to remember like, how did that beer taste two years ago and how has it changed now? Um, so you kind of have to just like accept that you're going along this journey of, of the beer changing and, and, but it's fun. And uh, yeah. yeah. You kind of uh, talked about the life cycle of the microbes in the bottle. Mm -hmm. Can you describe sensorily what happens? Like I'm thinking you mentioned PDO acts really slowly. So would the acidity go up over time or, or how would you describe the flavor changes? Yeah, I think usually when we, when we're packaging these beers, when we're putting them in bottle, they're, they're kind of at the end of their, uh, like I think, the majority of all the fermentation is done. Um, right. Otherwise, you know, we would get exploding bottles. <laughs> so I think there's, there's just some, there's some activity that happens. I would say it's probably more like enzymatic activity where Brett might be changing, uh, you know, maybe eating some glycosides or like changing aromatic compounds. So, uh, but in general, I, I would say that, yeah, like for a fruited beer, the fruit will drop off a little bit. Uh, for a beer that's just a blend of components, you might just get a different change in balance. So maybe the aromatics from the bread might change from, uh, you know, like uh, maybe like a horse blanket to more of like a fruity aroma mm. uh, through some of those enzymatic changes. But I, would, I wouldn't say that the acidity really changes too much. I think the PDO has already uh, done its job. Um, if we do blend it with a beer... You know, say we have a PDO, a beer that has PDO and we blend it with uh, a Saison that doesn't have PDO. There might be a little bit of 
acidity that develops in the bottle, but I would say that's pretty minuscule because we really make sure that these beers are fully fermented before we package them. There's really no, not much nutrients left. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's kind of hard. It's kind of hard to say. I think a really fun thing would be to take one, a bottle of, of the same beer, put it in the fridge and then put the other one in, in the cellar or in like a warmer spot you know, and try them in six months side by side or try them at one year side by side. Uh, we haven't really had the time to do that here, but that would be kind of a way to almost time travel, like lock one in place and then, and then taste the other, the other one later. But yeah, we've cracked, uh, we've, we've definitely cracked some fruit beers that we packaged first year and they're still surprisingly fruity. Like these, the microbes in there are really, really good at protecting the beer and, and transforming it. So, um, Yeah. Oh, awesome. That's a great idea. I, I never thought of that. And guess what I'm going to do? <laughs> Don, yeah, Don's already. I'm ready. That Yeah, that's. So if I go to your brewery, I can order cellar beer and take it home with me. That's the. Uh, are... Yeah, pr pretty much. Yeah. So we our cellar program. Um, we were doing like a selection of of bottles. So we were kind of doing like a curated list of about eight bottles uh, available uh to enjoy here and then mm -hmm. but we're extending that now to we're going to be opening it up to our entire cellar which you know we've currently have about we currently have about 36 37 releases some of them are completely mm. sold out, like we don't have any left but yeah. the list is going to be extensive it's going to be over uh, 20 bottles and yeah you can either uh you can either enjoy it in the tap room with friends or you can take it home and and try that and it's kind of like uh yeah absolutely how do you store these? Are they you know, refrigeration downstairs? Are they cellar temperature? What's uh, how are you protecting these beers? Yeah, so w we keep them at a consistent temperature. We unfortunately don't have like a an under a beautiful underground uh, cave system that we can store <laughs> these uh, bottles in. <laughs> but uh, I think the most important uh, thing to consider with with cellaring these beers is a consistent temperature uh, without fluctuations. I think fluctuations is where you uh, where you start uh, with contraction and expansion of the product inside the bottle, you start getting kind of like a pumping action where it like pulls oxygen in and then pushes it out. Um, you really want like a consistent, stable temperature, ideally around the six, you know, 14 to 16, like basement temperature. Uh, we don't have that at the brewery. Uh, so we just store all of them kind of together in one spot and, and in a place at the center of our brewery uh, that has the least amount of temperature fluctuation. Um, and that's been working really well for us. And we've, you know, like I mentioned, we've tried beers from year one that are still holding up extremely well. So I think, um, yeah, that's how we store ours. But I, at home, I would recommend keeping it in a, you know, in a cool area, like in a basement away from light. Uh, the base basements are good because they, they tend to have a very stable temperature throughout the year. Um, and yeah. Awesome. That's for, yeah. I like how it's nice to see breweries showcase things they've made before and let people get to try them. I don't know that well, many breweries that do that. And it's a labor of love too, because I mean, obviously you're delaying revenue by doing so, right? So I think that's great. Yeah, like the um, with my owner hat on, I'm kind of like, oh, that's a terrible idea. But with my <laughs> beer nerd hat on, I'm like, this is the coolest thing ever. <laughs> so of course we got to do it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much for being on the show. Um, is there any way people can reach out to you, social media, website for your brewery or yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, social media and our web. So social media is at Estbrew um, and our website, uh, www.establishmentbrewing.ca. And then uh, if anybody wants any more technical info or any questions about, you know, the technical side of stuff, feel free to email me at mike at establishmentbrewing.ca. That's probably the best way to get a hold of me. And um, yeah, any kind of technical questions you have about uh, wild beer, mixed culture, cellaring, fire me an email. I'm an open book. I love, love sharing it. the info and yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much awesome. for your time today, Mike. We really appreciate Ab it. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks, Cheers. Mike. Cheers. Neil Callahan is the beer director at Brickstore Pub in Decatur, Georgia, one of America's premier beer venues. 
An advanced Cicerone and BJCP judge, Neil has over 15 years of national and international experience working with breweries, distributors, importers, and retailers to elevate beer education, appreciation, and eloquence. Welcome to the show, Neil. Hey, thanks so much for having me. So uh, I have never been to your establishment, but the Brickstore Pub is very well known in the beer world as being kind of a place to drink. Um, and I did not know that you have how many beers in your cellar? So the bottle count where we're at right now at the end of 2023, we're just under 7,000 individual bottles. And that's comprising um, uh, somewhere between 600 and 650 individual labels and vintages and that sort of thing. So when you open up our vintage list, you're looking at between 600 and 650 different options. Good gravy. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of beer to keep up with. How does Is it one... a spreadsheet or? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a, yeah, that's a nerd question for you. Uh, it's it starts as a spreadsheet and then we put some, you know, a little bit of graphic design pixie dust on it and make it look more presentable. OK, how That's does awesome. one store so many beers, especially is it in a temperature controlled environment? I mean, you're in Georgia, so there's humidity and heat and whatnot. Um, how does one store all these beers to keep them secure? We've got two spaces. Uh, we have a space we call our this. is If somebody asks about our cellar, we bring them up the stairs and into our cellar room. It's a um, relatively small room. It's about eh, maybe eight by 10 or so, um, but it is climate controlled. It's humidity controlled. It stays 55, 56 degrees Fahrenheit year round. So there is okay. a cooling unit that keeps it at the perfect temperature, perfect humidity. It stays sealed unless there's somebody coming or going. Um, it's actually the placement and the location of the cellar room is perfect, not only for vintage beer, but it's also where we keep our casks. Um, so we keep our casks at essentially this perfect cellar temperature as well. So it works out great. And then we have a really the location of our pub. It's like a lot of things with the brick store. We say if we had planned it, we would have screwed it up. Um, but we happen to be in a building and next door to our building is uh, another building that used to be a bank. It was built back in the 30s. So we have been renting the bank vaults that are down below street level um, for a little over 12 or 13 years now. And that's where we keep sort of the inventory. That's where the majority of those um, 6,000 to 7,000 individual bottles live. So the upstairs room that is accessible that, you know, if you were to come into the brick store and talk to myself or one of the managers or staff members, we're happy to show you around our upstairs cellar. The downstairs cellar is more of the heavy inventory and more of kind of the stuff that we don't show uh, normal people. Um, I don't know what, what uh, movie number they're on, but it sounds like we have the makings of Oceans 14 or, or something. <laughs> something. Yeah, what's, like that. what's yeah. the what's the most expensive rare thing you've got down there? The stuff that I get excited about, to be totally honest with you, is the English barley wines. So we've got Thomas Hardy's going back to oh. 2003. I think we have three through eight. And then a sprinkling of um, some of the stuff once meantime took over. So unfortunately, we don't have any of the Eldridge Pope stuff because I believe mm -hmm. they stopped brewing. Like Eldridge Pope stopped brewing that beer, I want to say, 02. So 03 or 04 is when um, O'Hanlon's took over brewing that, that beer. So the all this stuff that we have that's Thomas Hardy's is from O'Hanlon's and then meantime has since been brewing that beer. But that's the stuff I get excited about. The most expensive ounce for ounce is we've got some Cantillon going back to 2004. We've got some 2004 oh, wow. Iris. So with that beer, you're looking a 750. I think we're in the like $120 range. So at that point, you're looking, you know, a couple bucks per ounce, which is not inexpensive. And then ticket price. We've got some six and nine liter bottles, some uh, St. Bernardus from about 10 years ago in a six liter. So that's the stuff that you're going to be shelling, you know, three to four hundred dollars out just by virtue of it being a, a lot of beer. That is a lot of beer. Um, how, how often like do people is it for 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 stag parties or somebody's retiring or like how often does do you sell one of these? The big bot, I'm thinking the, the big bottles. Yeah, special occasions. Absolutely. Um we're getting into the holidays, obviously, and that's a fun thing. You know, if people who have grown up around Decatur, all your friends are back in town and you go out and you buy six liters worth of St. Bernardus Ab 12 from 10 years ago. Why not? Right? <laughs> yeah, why not? Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. the holidays. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But it's very much special occasion. It's very much um, 
there are certain certain beers and certain like St. Bernard is, for instance, some of the barrel age stuff that they did that they really only released once or twice. That's stuff that people know that we have, that they know they are never going to have access to ever again. Um, and that's the stuff that they'll kind of buy two and three bottles of in a sitting and share with a bunch of people and say, hey, we're we're experiencing a beer that is never going to exist ever again. That's That stuff's really special. Right. Right. Every day but- is a special occasion, though. Yeah, you know, yeah, you can always Tuesday. find always find yeah. a reason to open up a two hundred dollar bottle of beer, right? It's Tuesday, uh, so exactly. why not? Yeah. Oh, there's a new uh, episode of the All About Beer podcast. I should go to <laughs> Brickstore Pub and drop a hundred dollars. I think nope. that's a good yeah. reason. I like the way you think, Don. <laughs> Sorry, am I keep? No, no, you're good. You're good. Um, but you're, you know, it's not just beers that are a hundred dollars, and you're, you're, you've got tons of other stuff what other things in your cellar are you know making you salivate what what are people coming in and are looking for the stuff that as soon as we put it on the menu disappears it's the canteon for sure Mm -hmm. um so in that sense we do a little bit of meeting out a little bit of you know once we feel like all right now this beer is something demonstrably different so you know I'm, i'm sitting here in our belgian array right now and i'm looking at Fafoon and I'm looking at Iris and I'm looking at St. Lambinus and these great beers. What we don't want to do is have that beer available and then have a beer that's like a year or two old, older of that same brand. And it just, it, it needs some time. It needs some time to evolve. What we want is for that experience to be different, that experience to be unique with a vintage beer. So once we do feel like, all right, this beer is different. This beer has matured in a way that we feel like it is, um, ready to be a part of our vintage program. As soon as we put some of that Canteon stuff on the shelf, it just disappears. So it's a question of not putting it all out at once because we would really like to have a 15 year old Canteon Mm. on the list rather than put it out, you know, a year or two after it comes in and then all of a sudden all of it's gone, you know? You're you're deliberately throttling supply. Not not officially, it's because you want to, to keep some stuff back. You know, I'd probably find some more flowery language to uh, explain that, but you're exactly you're exactly right. It's it's you're on on the mark. We're throttling okay. what yeah. what we put on the shelf. You're totally right. Can you um, buy buy? Sorry to interrupt. On can no, you buy? Can you buy vintage beer and then put it in, or you buy your? Are you doing what you said, where you're? I don't want to use the word throttle, but you're holding withholding things. Um, to keep them is there a way you can buy vintage stuff now like like so i don't i don't i don't know how the you know how this kind of works sure so no the vast majority of what we have we purchased when it was quotey fingers fresh mm-hmm. um, and have aged at our own location and that's partly because of availability to your point m it's just sort of um it's very infrequent that a distributor will come to us and say hey we have this three-year-old Rochefort 10, do you want it? Um, mm-hmm. It happens occasionally. Every okay. now and then they'll say, hey, we actually found this pallet in the back or um, the an importer or a brewer will say, hey, we found this at the back of the brewery. Is this something that you feel like you would want to have a part of your program? And, and we can sort of immediately bring it in, put it on the shelf and say, hey, this is a five-year-old, yeah, again, Rochefort 10, just kind of pulling that brand out of, mm-hmm. out of a hat. Um, but the majority of it is stuff that we age ourselves which is really what we prefer because that way we know how that beer has been stored. We know the temperature it's been stored at. We know that it's not been sitting, you know, on a loading dock in the blazing sun in Georgia for six weeks. And then somebody goes, Oh shit, I should probably, you know, (laughs) probably put this on a truck and get it out of there. So you also know it's real. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, it's not wine. So thankfully we're not worried about, you know, counterfeit labels coming in or anything like that. Um, But that being said, yeah, you're, you're totally right. There's there's definitely opportunity for somebody to take a, you know, a label from an empty bottle of 1990s, you know, uh, bone goose and slap it on another bottle. Yeah, you're totally right. Mm. So we, to answer your question, there's not as much opportunity to purchase, let's say, pre-aged beer. Um, yeah. But even when those opportunities do present themselves, we're a little wary because we want to know exactly how that beer has been handled from when it was put into a bottle until it lands at our door. Um, Makes sense. You you keep saying bottles, bottles, bottles. Is it only bottles that can be cellared as opposed to cans? And do they have to be 
corked. I'm thinking mostly champagne corks, but I guess uh, Cantillon is not a champagne cork, but it does have like a wine cork under the cap. Right. Yeah. It's uh, cork and cap. Absolutely. So what we have found is that for the most part, um, bottled beer does age better. Uh, that's things that, so in a past life, I uh, worked with Cigar City for many years and we had talked about putting our big imperial stout Hunapus in a can and talked with the folks at Ball who manufactured our cans. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, we were asking them about aging. Can we age this beer in a can? And basically they said, yeah, we're still trying to figure out what the shelf life is on canned beer because there is a lining on the inside of that can um, oh. that, that will degrade over time in a way that glass will not. That being said, we like to experiment. So there are a couple cans that we're sitting on. Um, I haven't had a beer from a can that's more than six or seven years old. And to be honest, the, those beers I've found have held up well. Um, but my experience dealing with Ball specifically and them saying, yeah, you know, we're still trying to figure out what what we feel comfortable telling our consumers about, you know, mm -hmm. being able to age that beer in a can. So to answer your question, it's much more glass. Absolutely. Part of it, too, is the styles of beer that are going to be appropriate for aging. Um, a lot of European beer, a lot of Belgian beer, a lot of Lambic, a lot of mixed culture stuff. Um, and those are all styles and sort of brewing cultures that you don't see a whole lot of cans. Does that make sense? Right. Yep, totally does. Uh, you, you did mention that just to, I don't want to belabor the point, but you did mention you, you tried some of these older cans and they held up well, but did they improve the way some of your uh, cellared beers would improve in bottles? Now that's a big that's a big question you're asking there, Don. So <laughs> the it's a big question because it goes to a larger point about cellaring beer is does it get better? That's an absolutely subjective question. Right. Um does it change is maybe a better question, but th that's an easier question to answer. Um yeah, absolutely. They they do change. Generally okay. speaking, a lot of times the level of dissolved oxygen in cans is going to be a little bit lower than it is in bottles, just generally speaking. Um, and that oxygen interacting with the beer over a period of time, again, under certain temperature conditions and certain humidity conditions, that's what's going to evolve the beer, if I can kind of use evolve as a verb there. Um, so all that to say, you know, I don't know that I could have the same beer in a bottle and a can packaged on the same day open both of them up 10 years later and be able to pick out which one's a can and which one's a bottle. You know what I mean? Right. Um, so it's, it's again, very much experimenting. It's very much experimenting with styles. It's ex experimenting with um, package format. So it's, uh, you know, a 2010 St. Bernardus Ab 12 in a 11.2 ounce bottle, in a 750 and in a six liter bottle those beers are going to be completely different beers just based on the volume of beer in that uh, in that package compared to, again, the level of dissolved oxygen. So that um, that to me is a more interesting experiment as far as, you know, the size of the package as opposed to a can versus a bottle. Right. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. When you're storing these, are you storing them upright or are you are they on their sides? And what would be the like pros and cons of doing either of them? We keep all of our bottles upright. And this is something okay. we've discussed with a lot of brewers that we've discussed with a lot of people who have been doing, let's say, you know, Lambic styles and some of the more traditional European style beers. Um, Rob and Jason from Allagash specifically, we had picked their brains a lot about um, how they want their beers to be stored over a period of time. So we keep all of our bottles upright for a couple of reasons. One of them is just essentially the amount of oxygen that's being exposed to the beer. When you lay it on its side, that headspace does essentially creates a, an amount of oxygen that's touching more of the beer than when the beer is upright. Um, part of it too is for service. You know, almost all of the beers that are in our vintage collection are bottle conditioned. So if we're keeping the, the beer on its side, Somebody orders this beer. Now, all of a sudden, all that yeast sediment is down on the side of the bottle, essentially. So that's something where we're nervous about disturbing that yeast sediment. And we don't want we don't want to pour a murky, uh, you know, 15 year old Orval for somebody. We want that beer to be in as ready to serve condition as possible. So we keep all of our bottles upright. Um, the 
uh, integrity of the cork is something that we are always trying to be cognizant of. You know, when you talk to people that age wine, um, you talk to sommeliers and people with vintage wine collections, they're generally keeping their wine on the side to keep that cork hydrated. They don't want that cork to dry out. Now, all of a sudden you have oxidized corked wine. So that's something we do try to stay cognizant of. But like you were mentioning earlier, Don, um, stuff like the Cantillon that has the cork and cap. The cap helps keep the cork hydrated. Um, and then most of the time, if there's a cork on a different kind of bottle, it is going to be, like you said, that champagne cork, which is thicker, it's more dense, we're not as worried about um, that cork drying out. But it is something that we do, that we do run into from time to time, and we do kind of, um, you know, have to keep an eye on. And to, to that point, if I can kind of pivot from there, um, during the pandemic, we were doing, just like everybody else, we're doing everything that we could to keep our doors open and keep uh, you know some revenue coming in to keep payroll and to keep as many people employed as possible. So we were doing a good amount of vintage beer to go. And that's something we really hadn't played with in the past. Now that we're sort of obviously moving out of the pandemic, um, our vintage collection, we're, we tell people this is for on-premise consumption only. And that's for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, we don't know what is, what is going to happen to that beer once it leaves the door. So Somebody can spend, you know, a hundred bucks on a super cool, rare 750 of some cool Belgian beer. Then it goes in their trunk and it sits in the trunk for six weeks. They forget about it or, um, you know, they, once it leaves the door, we don't know how that beer is being treated. So what we don't want is for somebody to not treat the beer the same way we would and then open up the beer and go, oh, this beer sucks. What the hell? You, uh, brick store doesn't know what they're doing. You know, I pay yeah. all this money for this mm -hmm. beer. Um yeah which is yeah we obviously we don't want that mm -hmm. the other thing is we use the word experimenting when it comes to our vintage beer all the time because we don't know we really don't know how some of these bottles are going to evolve um we know which brands and which styles generally we find evolve in ways that we find compelling and interesting um but you never know the cap on that particular bottle may not have sealed properly um so if somebody does order vintage beer they when they open it up here at the pub and they go, you know, this is actually fucking terrible. Um, then we can pivot from there. We can basically, you know, try a little bit of that beer and go, you know what? That beer is absolutely gone wrong. It's it's oxidized, it's flat, it's there's something wrong with this. So at that point, we can kind of take it from there with the guests. And we can either say, all right, how about we open up another bottle of that same vintage, that same beer? Let's see if it's just that whole batch or if it's just that particular bottle. Or hey, you know what? If, yeah, the St. Bernardus Ab 12 that you were drinking just is this not cutting it for you, then let's look at a, yeah, a Chimay Blue. Let's look at a Roche for 10. Let's look at something else of that same vintage that we feel like, you know, we, we can remediate that particular not so good beer. And we can't do that if somebody brings that beer home. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, it makes um, sense. I think uh, everybody appreciates that they have to pay for the work and effort that you put into this. And and thank you, by the way, for putting the work and effort into this. But how do you uh, set the price for each vintage? Like, do you just say, OK, inflation is X percent. And so we'll we'll just increase the price by 10 percent for every year. Or or how do you do that? It's uh, art, not a science. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, part of it is inventory. Part of it, you know, when I go down and count 7,000 bottles of fucking beer in a bank vault uh, over the span of two or three days. Um, part of it, we'll look and we go, well, we got like five cases of this stuff. Um, you know, we can price it a little more. We can drop the price a little bit. I see. If, yeah. If we go, oh, we only have two bottles left of this vintage Orval. You know what? We got to probably raise the price a little bit because we want it to be, you know, part of the collection here. We want as much as we can to have um full verticals of of certain brands for sure so part of its inventory part of it is trying the beer there's plenty of beers that will open up and go you know what it's good for now but maybe a year from now it ain't going to be so good so let's drop the price let's price it a little more aggressively and let's excuse me let's get it moving a little bit more um really depends on a, a couple different factors um part of it is um straight up personal preference if if I'm looking at a bottle of beer that I know is really, really great that just isn't moving, let's drop the price a little bit. And now let's um, take that as an opportunity to do some staff training. And, and we do 
uh, training with our staff twice a week, every week. And when we talk about vintage beer, a lot of times I'll pick out certain bottles that I know just kind of fly under the radar, but I'm going, man, this beer is just exceptional. It's priced very reasonably. We, we, you guys need to try this. So when you get excited about it, staff member, then you are going to get your guests excited about it. So, you know, again, it's a uh, art, not a science, but um, yeah, always different ways to look at it. Yeah. I appreciate that. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of your guests, let's say they want to start vintaging beer at home. Um, do you have any advice for people who are selling their beers at home? Uh, and the importance of whatever that advice may be? Uh, temperature as much as you can. If you can keep that beer cool, cool too cold, that's great. You know, keeping a bunch of imperial stouts uh, in your linen closet in the hallway, I, uh, that beer is probably not going to hold up very, very long. Um, mm -hmm. But as as much as you can, either keep it cool. Again, we keep our cellar right around 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Not everybody has the space. Not everybody has the resources to purchase, you know, a wine cooler or purchase a separate refrigerator for vintage beer. But as much as you can, keep that beer cool. And then secondly, experiment to that point. If, you know, me personally, if I'm buying some beer to sit on for a while, I buy a couple bottles, at least two or three. That way, a year or two in, I can open that beer up, at least one of those bottles and say, oh, you know what? This beer is probably going to hold up for a while, or this beer is already not very good. Let's open up the rest of it. Um, there is very much a bell curve to all beers. It's, it is the, again, we're talking very much about a hedonic um, personal preference type style of um, appreciating these beers. So for me, what I think the bell curve on certain beers is where, all right, this beer is getting better, better. And now this beer is actually falling off. What my vision, the kind of bandwidth of that bell curve may be a little more narrow than somebody else. Um, but I can't think of a beer where the my personal appreciation and the length of time is a straight line. Does that make sense? Oh, sure. Yeah. So don't be, it's, I know a lot of these beers, and I'm the same way. There's certain beers I just, for personal reasons, for um, sentimental reasons, I just don't want to open it up. It's probably, probably getting better, but you got to open these beers eventually because eventually that beer is going to turn a corner and not going to get any better, you know, as the days go on. And possibly worse. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, pro pro probably worse, you know, probably and, that's, worse, yeah. and that's an experiment that I keep using that word, but that's an experiment that we go through every single day here at the brick stores. There's bottles that I open up and go, man, this beer is going to be killer. And I drink it and go, this is awful. Like we, <laughs> and that's something we do have to do uh, plenty of times where shit we're sitting on three cases of this beer i just opened up three different bottles of it and every one of those bottles was garbage you know what those bottles are going down the drain or those bottles or are um what i do like to do with those bottles that have turned is we're going to save those for some more staff training we're going to talk about how beer can go bad we're going to uh, talk about the effects of yeah. oxygen we're going to talk about um what happens when you sit on a beer for too long so we you know we find things to do with those beers but those things do not include selling them to guests. If, if we decide a beer is just this shit, this just ain't cutting it anymore. Right. Okay. So I have a fun question for you. Uh, you've, uh, you know, obviously you've tasted a lot of cellared beer. What is the greatest beer you've had where you think its greatness was because of the celery? Hmm. That's, that's a really great question. The beer that immediately comes to mind um, and I'm kind of surprised that I'm even saying this for a couple of reasons is uh, Goose Island <laughs> Bourbon, Bourbon County. Oh. Um, I had a Bourbon County stout from, I want to say 2009. And this was maybe two or three years ago. Uh, so at that point it had, you know, what? 12 years or so. 11 yeah, years. Yeah. yeah. Somewhere around there. Um, first of all, generally speaking, when you go into the brick store cellar, we don't have a lot of stouts. We find that that bell curve again on stouts is pretty narrow where, for a year or two, the beer might evolve in a way that we find appealing, but it drops off very, very quickly. And all of a sudden you feel like you're just drinking a lot of dark fruit. You know, the chocolate quality falls off, the roast quality falls off, and you just feel like you're kind of drinking a weird tasting Belgian strong dark ale sometimes. Um, secondly, so first of all, for again, for me to say, all right, Bourbon County is a beer that 
just evolved in, in such a wonderful way. It really did because it maintained a lot of the roast. It maintained a lot of the chocolate quality, but it also mellowed out some of the more aggressive bourbon spice. It mellowed out some of the vanilla qualities of that beer um, and brought out this really interesting dark dark fruit, almost like a plummy quality that didn't overwhelm what I was expecting out of that imperial stout. Um, so, you know, say what you want about AB ownership or anything like that. Bourbon County Stout, to me, is a beer that evolves in such a wonderful, in defiance of how most other stouts evolve kind of way. I, I really like that beer. Awesome. Thank you. It is a really good beer to age. I've, and I've I, Yeah. And I do like that it's fairly broadly distributed. And I, I know Bourbon mm -hmm. County is hard to get sometimes, but at mm -hmm. least it is distributed, you know, kind of everywhere. So yeah, awesome. absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say it's priced not like for a, a beer that's rare in air quotes. Um, I think it's what, $13, $12 a bottle. So it probably I, I, you could probably get a four pack of that and they release it right around Thanksgiving. So mm -hmm. coming up, you could probably buy a four pack for, you know, 13, 14 bucks. It's nothing yeah. too crazy. Um, but that's it's just a, a wonderful, lovely beer. And there's times where I would rather reach for one of those that's 10 years old than a you know, pick your favorite, tough to find, got to wait in line for six hours, Imperial Stout Brewer. Um, mm -hmm. I, Bourbon County holds up better. Yeah. Cool. It's, That's it's great a good advice. One. Yeah. yeah. Go buy a Bourbon County. <laughs> AB, <laughs> if you're listening, you can sponsor us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they probably got a couple bucks for sponsorship. I, yeah, I hear they got it. I hear they have some money. I don't know. Um, we will take a small fraction of what they're spending <laughs> on you on the UFC. So. Uh, oh yeah, Jesus. Yeah. One percent. Uh, <laughs> Just kidding. Anyway, Neil, thank you so much for uh, joining us today to talk about your amazing vintage and seller. It sounds. I love that it's in a bank vault. Like that just kind of tracks. I love that too. Yeah. I think that's lovely. Um, it's yeah, it's pretty damn cool. But uh, we'd love to have you guys down here in Decatur, Georgia. Um, anybody who's coming through Atlanta, please come by, check out our vintage list. Um, our vintage list is great. The stuff we have on draft that is an age, I think, is pretty great as well. And we're just excited to ha have have people in the pub and share a little bit about what gets us excited about beer with uh, with our guests. So, um, can I just ask for people who are not familiar with Decatur, how far is it from the Atlanta airport so that people can understand how easy it is to get to you or not? From the airport without traffic, 20, 25 minutes. Um, yeah. You can also hop on a MARTA. That's, you know, the, the subway system here in Atlanta and be here in 30 to 40 minutes. Um, we're within the perimeter. So 285 is the perimeter that goes around Atlanta. We're within the perimeter. So even though Decatur is its own little municipality, we were a part of the Atlanta scene. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, if people want to reach out to you or learn about the Brickstore Pub, uh, Facebook, social media, website, what's the best way to reach out? Yeah, the website has our full vintage list on it. That's brickstorepub.com. Um, we do post on Instagram pretty frequently. That's brickstorepub. Um, we don't post a ton about the vintage program, partly because Instagram is our way to get uh, information about events out. And we mm -hmm. have events through uh, out the nose, really at least one or two uh, a week at this point. We're doing whether it's a brewery spotlight or whether it's a um, spotlight, like we just did an event with Riverbend Malting, kind of showcased a bunch oh. of beers that have their malt oh. in it. Um, so there's always something going on. There's always new exciting beers on draft, but our Instagram is a great way to keep up with that. And um, we do post about our vintage program with some frequency on there, but great resource for everything going on here at the pub. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Neil. We really appreciate it. And uh, can't wait to get down there one day and try that cellar. It's going to yeah. be good. Yeah, we'll just see you guys me down in there. there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank Absolutely. you, Neil. Yeah, Cheers. thank you so much, Don. How'd you think that show go? You're gonna are you gonna sell her more beer? Uh, I don't want to sell her more beer because okay, I do fair. have, but um, <laughs> you want to drink more cellar beer? I'm gonna drink more cellar beer. I'm gonna be more. I I I sell her beer and then I just kind of drink it and I enjoy it. But I want to mm -hmm. be more thoughtful in terms of trying yeah. to remember what the one year age tasted like, so that when I have it two years. Uh, you know, I can compare and I, and I want to look for the flavors that our guests uh, described for us. So, um, so I'm excited about that. And and you am 
yeah, more dry. I like more dryness, less alcohol, more sweetness. Uh, I think a little age can do really well for a fair amount of beer styles. Although fresh is best for most of them. I think it's really cool to kind of hold on to a beer or even do maybe a vertical where you yeah. have a couple of years in a row and give them a try. Uh, I've got a Goose Island vertical in my basement that's from 2017. And I really uh, think it's time I drink that. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that was... Uh... That was one of the favorites, right, of uh, of Neil. So uh, yeah, that's true. All right. Yeah. Well, I think I'll uh, maybe uh, maybe this Christmas we'll open them. That'll be a good. That's a good. Yeah. There you yeah. go. Or you know, or again, you don't have to have a special occasion to open cellar beer. Or you that's know, right. Tuesday could maybe next week I'll drink it. Who knows? Yeah. Let us know. <laughs> Let us know I how will. it goes. I will. I will. Visit allaboutbeer.com and follow us on social media at allaboutbeer. And again, if you're feeling generous, visit our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash allaboutbeer to support this show and others. If you have any questions for the export experts, email podcast at allaboutbeer.com. That's also the email for feedback, suggestions, or to inquire about supporting the show through advertising. Malt Europe Malting Company is based in North America, specializing in growing and producing quality malts for the craft beer and distilling industries. With local farms and malt houses spread across the United States, Canada, and Mexico, Malt Europe Malting Company's commitment to excellence is fully ingrained into every batch it produces, ensuring breweries and distilleries of any size can create the finest beverages on the planet. Visit malteuropemaltingco.com to learn how Malt Europe Malting Company can support your malting needs. Contact Malt Europe Malting Company at customer success at malteurope.com or dial 844-546-MALT for questions or to place your order. Don, how can people reach out to you? Uh, I am at the dawn of beer on Twitter threads and Instagram, and I love receiving emails at dawn at the dawn of beer.com. And you am? I am at so, uh, pints and panels across all social media. And my website is pints and panels.com. Uh, we will return in two weeks with a brand new show. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Don, are you excited about uh, the end of the year. I think we've got some good things coming up. Uh, we definitely have some good things uh, coming up. And I always love talking about beer with you, Em. So Aw, shucks. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, everybody. Cheers, everyone. Drink that cellar beer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>